Uh, also thankful to those of you who responded to uh, the Facebook question. There were a few of them. Uh, I think Karen Davis is going to be our winner of the, uh, the little award. So uh, it's just a, a piece of candy. I'll get that to you later. But uh, some, <laughs> some, of you saw the, uh, some of you saw the question, uh, and many of you didn't respond for whatever reason. I think people are worried about being judged uh, posting on a church Facebook what they would do with a million dollars, right? In fact, somebody even asked me this morning, am I supposed to put what I really would do or am I supposed to put what I'm supposed to do? Uh, and that's sort of how we feel when we think about money, right? There are the things that I want to do and there are the things that I'm supposed to do. Uh, in fact, I'm going to sh- throw uh, Shane Underwood under the bus this morning. He told me that if, if he would have posted, he would have said that he would buy a bunch of cameras to put around town to catch the pastor injuring himself uh, while he was running. Uh, so I'm sure there's going to start uh, a donation pot for Shane so that he can purchase cameras going forward. But um, this is a question we think about a lot, right? What would we do if we had a million dollars or if we suddenly accrued a large sum of money? Uh, What things could we do with it? What things would we want to do with it? What things would be best to do with it? A lot of us, I think, would uh, buy a few things that we've wanted for a long time, and uh, we would maybe give some of it away. Uh, Maybe some of you would be inspired to start your own business or to, uh, to do something that you've always dreamed of, to maybe start a nonprofit that you think could change the world and finally fix some of the world's ills. There are uh, tons of things that we feel like we could do if we had access to a little bit more money. And we think about these things on smaller scales as well. We teach our children how they ought to spend their money to save a little bit, to give a little bit, and then to live on the rest of what remains. And we look at our budgets. Hopefully you have a budget that you look at on a frequent basis so that you're seeing where your money is going, uh, whether you're spending too much of it on yourself or maybe you have a little bit more that you could spend on somebody else and you don't recognize it. There are tons of things to think about when it comes to thinking about money. One of my first introductions to money, well, there were, there were two of them, really, when I was a teenager. Uh, one of them was uh, I got a checking account, and my parents could look at that checking account and see where I was spending my money and where it was going and things like that. And uh, I was spending a lot of money at McDonald's, and so my dad made me sit down and calculate how much money I had spent at McDonald's. And I, of course, was earning this money as a bag boy at Kroger, and I think what he didn't recognize at the time was an even bigger problem, and that's the amount of money I was spending to buy food on my break time at Kroger. Uh, I calculated one time uh, when I finally realized this, and it was about an hour or an hour and a half's work uh, to buy food that I would eat in less than 15 minutes uh, on my break time. If you're wondering what it was, it was a Rockstar Energy Drink and Sushi. Uh, They're a great pairing if you don't know. Uh, So that's what I would spend my money on. But when we think about our money, where we spend it, what we're doing with it, what we would do if we had a large sum of it, it sort of exposes our thoughts on money, exposes our hearts and uh, what we would do with that resource. And even more than a hypothetical, sometimes we can think about our current habits with money. We think about where we're spending our money and what we're doing with it. And a lot of the time, we think about stuff when it comes to money. We want to have more things because we think that things and stuff are what will bring us satisfaction. And I think if we were really pressed, we would recognize that stuff and things don't bring us satisfaction. But when it comes down to it, most days we spend our money or spend our time thinking about spending money on more stuff. This is sort of the the average American difficulty, right? Spending too much of our money on stuff. And there are things that we do need. There's stuff that's helpful to have, things like a car, Uh, especially with where we live. It's helpful to be able to get to and from places. Things aren't that close together. We don't live in a really big city where you can walk everywhere. So having a car is helpful. Having a smartphone oftentimes is very helpful. Uh, You can communicate with people. You can complete transactions that you need to complete on the Internet. Uh, So things like cars and smartphones and plenty of other things and stuff are helpful to have in our God-given gifts, I believe, to us in modern society so that we can live our lives in a better way. 
It's not necessarily bad to have stuff or think about buying stuff, but oftentimes that stuff doesn't bring us joy or happiness. In fact, uh, I found a book this week. I've not had time to read it all, but I was able to skim some of it called Happy Money, The Science of Happier Spending by Elizabeth Dunn and Michael Norton. And Michael Norton is a professor at the Harvard Business School, and uh, Elizabeth Dunn is also a professor. And they wrote this book based on a number of scientific experiments and scientific data that they found. Uh, And it looks at how we can spend our money so that we might get more joy. And it's not a Christian book, per se, but it's still is valuable in thinking about things that really bring us joy rather than stuff. And so they give five different things that people should do. The first one is to buy experiences, spend money uh, doing things rather than having things. The second is to, uh, to keep treats. So if you have something you enjoy buying, and the example they use uh, just in the introduction of the book is a Hershey's Kiss. Even if you put off eating that small piece of chocolate for some time, you make it a treat and it remains enjoyable to you. And the same goes with how you spend your money. If you put something off, if you don't buy something every single day, maybe that cup of coffee you like to buy every morning, if you maybe do once a week, put it off so that it remains a treat. The third thing is buying time. So paying for maybe services or goods that save you time, that allow you to enjoy your time doing other things. And the fourth one is to pay now and to consume later. Uh, Of course, this would mean avoiding large amounts of debt, which we as Americans struggle to do. It would mean saving money so that you can afford to buy whatever it is that you buy and then enjoy it after the fact so that you're not thinking about the money aspect of it later. And this fifth enjoyment, this fifth way that we can spend our money in a happier way is the subject of our sermon today, the subject of the text in scripture that we'll look at in Luke chapter 16. If you would turn with me to Luke chapter 16, if you don't have a physical Bible, I would commend to you uh, the Version Bible app on your phone. It has great plans that you can read during the week uh, when you're not at church, or maybe if you're stuck somewhere, uh, maybe getting a car work done or having to run an errand that requires you to wait for a long time, uh, then pull up that Bible app on your phone and read a little bit of scripture. So Luke chapter 16, and we'll be in verses 1 through 9 today. And this begins some teaching by Jesus that is explicitly financial. We've looked a lot in the Gospel of Luke at Jesus' teaching, and we've talked about how uh, he's spoken a lot on money in Luke. Luke seems to pick up on Jesus' teaching on money more than the other Gospels. And sometimes that's for the sake of a lesson, right? Jesus will use money as a metaphor. But other times, like today, Jesus teaches explicitly about how we use our money and how we ought to use our money. And so that is part of the lesson that we'll have today. Luke chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Jesus told his disciples, There was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management. Because you cannot be manager any longer. So this is the backdrop of the story, uh, the backdrop of the parable that Jesus is giving us. The manager is accused of misusing the master's wealth. And uh, we don't really know exactly how. We're not given details on that. And it can be easy to get distracted by that when we read this story. We can start to wonder, well, what did he do? How was he dishonest? How did he misuse the funds? And certainly that's something to think about, but with this particular passage of Scripture, we're sort of going to put that question aside. And so don't get lost thinking about that. The more important problem here is that this man is losing his job, and he's not going to have an income anymore. The master has told him, you're going to have to give an account for what you've done. And uh, it it can be easy to be caught in, well, why is this? But again, I want to urge you to think about what Jesus has in view here rather than specifically what this man has done. So verses 3 through 7. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? 
My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 450. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. So what's behind the parable? The key lesson is very clear. This man wants to make friends. He's not overly concerned about getting in legal trouble. And in fact, the master doesn't seem entirely concerned about that as well. But he knows that he's going to need people once he finishes his job. And he wants to use his position now to have long-term gain down the road. His job is clearly going to be short-lived from now on. But he wants to live much longer down the road. And the money that he's responsible for, that he's cutting debts from, is no small sum either. It's probably the case that this master has the manager because he's a very successful businessman. And he can't afford to track every single thing, so he hires people like the master to keep track of things. He's maybe like the, the manager is like a modern-day CPA. Maybe he's the CFO of this particular business. And so he's tracking these debts and uh, getting money for his master. And in fact, the oil that is uh, listed, the 900 gallons of oil, is likely three years worth of wages. Three years worth of wages. So you can compute that with your own income. If we use maybe a somewhat conservative estimate of today's incomes, it would be about $120,000 to $150,000. And the manager takes that amount that's due to his master and cuts it to 75000 or 60000 So cuts it in half. And you can imagine how somebody receiving that type of debt forgiveness would feel. They'd be pretty excited, right? And I know that I would certainly welcome somebody into my home if they cut my debts by that much. I would be glad to receive them. And that's what the manager wants. He wants to build friends by cutting their debts. And again, we're not told exactly how this happens or whether it's legal or illegal. I read some scholars that said maybe he's cutting from his own take of the debt. Maybe he's refusing to take his commission so that he can receive friends going forward. Or maybe he's cutting from the interest that was within his purview to do. Maybe he had capacity to say, you know what, we're going to change the interest rate a little bit and your amount due will be $75,000 rather than $150,000. Again, it's hard to know the details of what this man is doing, but that's not the primary point of the story. Look with me at verses 8 through 9. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly, for the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. I imagine, like today, the people listening to the parable that Jesus is telling would have wondered what they would have done in the master's position. I wonder if some of them, instead of cutting bills, would have tried to take a bigger commission so that they could have money when they lost their job. Or maybe they would have started looking for another job right away. But what this manager knows is that he's not going to be able to get a referral from his master. So probably finding another job is going to be pretty difficult. And what the manager knows, what the master commends, and what Jesus encourages us to recognize is that more than any stuff that we can acquire, more than any experiences we want to have, more than all the treats in the world, and more than one million dollars, better than all of those things, is a few good friends. That's what the manager knows. The master commends and Jesus teaches us today. Better than a million dollars is a few good friends. 
You know, we think about the value of stuff. We think about the value of our time or the value of our education. We put dollar amounts on those things oftentimes. Time is money, we like to say. And certainly, time is important. Stuff is sometimes valuable. Our education is often valuable. But more valuable than those things are the people in your life. The people that can help you when you fall down. The people that can love you when you feel unloved. The people that can guide you when you feel lost. And that is what the manager knows, the master commends, and Jesus teaches us. We could even say that the manager paid people to be his friends. Now, I don't recommend that to you because then you get the wrong type of friends oftentimes. But that's almost what he's doing, giving them some money so that they might be his friend down the road. That's how valuable he recognizes friends to be. And we know that this is true. We often would acknowledge that our family's important, our friends are important, our neighbors are important, but we forget it so easily. I've mentioned before the longest Harvard study on longevity that started in 1938, tracked men from Harvard and how long they lived, and now it's tracking their children and grandchildren. And those who were the healthiest, maybe 20, 30 years after they surveyed them, were those who acknowledged satisfaction in their relationships. People are important. More than stuff and experiences and knowledge, we are built for each other. We know this from this passage. We know this from various studies that we've seen. But even more than that, we know it from the rest of God's work. So if you read scripture starting in the Old Testament, we hear that man was created in God's image, that Adam is created, and God says it is not good for man to be alone. So he creates Eve to be with Adam. And then they're expelled from the garden. And then down the road, we reach Abraham, who's promised to have many offspring, to have a large group of people in his name. Move a little further down the road, and the Israelites find themselves enslaved to Egypt. And when they're enslaved to Egypt, what does God do but send a man, Moses, to lead them out, Aaron, to help lead them out of slavery. And then the people of Egypt, after they've uh, done a relatively bad job of following the law, they refuse to go into the promised land, one generation dies, and then they walk into promise, the promised land with another man, Joshua, leads them into the promised land. And then judges are appointed, and then finally they recognize, you know what, everybody else has a king, a man to follow, a person who can guide us, who can lead us. And so... God gives them kings. And still, even in all of this, the Israelites, with other people around them, with people to follow, do a bad job of following God. So what does God do to solve this problem? He plops down a big bag of money in every Israelite home. No, that's not what God does. He doesn't give them tons of money. He sends yet another man, Another person that they can know and have a relationship with and listen to and be taught by. And that man, his name is Jesus. And he's the one who is teaching us today. Because we were made in the image of God. A triune God who relates Father, Son, and Holy Spirit one to another. So we are called to relate to another, to have relationships with each other to depend not on our money, not on our stuff, but on people. And most ultimately, we're called to depend on one person, Jesus the Messiah. We were built for relationships. We were built for a relationship with Jesus, and we were built for a relationship with one another. But it's so easy to forget that. That fifth science of happier spending moment, that fifth opportunity for people to uh, receive happiness from their money a little bit more than they usually do, 
was to spend money on others. Again, something science demonstrates that Jesus tells us here in Scripture 2,000 years ago. But the interesting thing about it is that in their studies, uh, the authors looked at three experiments. In one particular study they did, they reviewed three experiments. And in two of those experiments, people were asked to spend money on someone else. Oftentimes they were given maybe a gift card or a small amount of cash, and they were told, go spend it on somebody else. And then there was another group who was told to spend it on themselves. And the group that spent the money on someone else reported higher levels of happiness. But the third experiment, people were just asked to sit down and to go through an interview and to talk about when they had spent money on somebody else and when they had spent money on themselves. And the people that weren't asked to do it right then in the moment, the people that didn't have the opportunity to experience giving money to somebody else, reported being happier when they spent money on themselves. See, they had forgotten the happiness of spending money on others, of building relationships. In fact, there was another study that done in that Dunn and Norton looked at. And in that study, they handed out Starbucks gift cards. And there was one group that spent the Starbucks gift card on themselves. There was another group that gave the gift card to somebody else. And there was a third group that used the gift card with somebody else, sat down, had a cup of coffee. And you won't be surprised to know that the third group reported the most happiness. The group that spent money with somebody else, that had an experience with them, that grew a relationship with them. We are relational beings because we are made in the image of the ultimate relational being who sent his own son to be with us. But again, you don't need modern science to know this. From today's parable From the end of Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4, we're given summary statements where we're told that the church meets together. They learn about the Lord from the teaching of the apostles. They worship him together. They pray. They break bread. And in both of those passages, we're told that people give of themselves, give of their possessions, give of their money for those who are in need because they recognize the importance of those relationships. In fact, I heard a pastor this week talk about how in latter books of the New Testament that were written after the time of Jesus, the word disciple is replaced by the word brother because that familial relationship among Christians is recognized as so important among those authors. And so I think about what this means for us and how we are called to use our wealth to spend our money on relationships. And many of you do that very well. You spend money on friends and family, on neighbors, on fellow brothers and sisters in this church, and that is a great thing. But for those of you who are asking, well, I don't really know where to start. I don't really know what to do with this. My advice to you would be to have a meal with somebody else. Have coffee with somebody else. Have that Starbucks experience. You can do it at Cheney Bros as well. Have that relational experience with somebody else. Think about how you spend your money. And rather than a million dollars, what you would do with a few good friends. Who those friends are and how you are investing in those relationships. Because Jesus invested in you and continues to invest in you and continues to desire a relationship with you. And who knows, over the past year, I've learned that there are many of you who don't know each other. Of course, it's hard to know everybody in a large congregation like this. 70, 75, 80 people sometimes that show up. You can't know everyone, right? That's difficult. But who knows that the shared interests that are had in this room Somebody wants to change the world in X way. And somebody else wants to change the world in that same way, but both of them are missing different parts of the puzzle. Who knows if you started having dinner with each other, if you started having coffee with each other, where those passions would meet. 
and how the Lord would work in those relationships. I have no doubt that it would be a powerful thing if our church got to know our church a little bit better. Jesus doesn't just want you to know him, but He wants you to know other adopted brothers and sisters in the family of God. So I would encourage you to seek out a new relationship, to take somebody to coffee, take somebody to lunch, and share that time together. Because you, too, want to be welcomed into eternal dwellings. When you reach the end of all things, you'll be able to look back with people who share your faith in Jesus and think about the opportunities that you had to grow together in faith. This week, I googled, man saves self with money. There were 194,000 news results, 194,000. But they were a little bit strange. This was the first headline that I got. Five things to do. B-Town Hot Summer Nights has entertainment for all ages. Doesn't really seem to match the search query very well. And so then I googled community rallies around. And it had 1.8 million news results. So 10 times more news results. And these matched a little bit better. Community rallies around 11-year-old injured in roller coaster. Whiteville community rallies around boy burned in fire. Community rallies around displaced Escambia County residents following fire. Community rallies around man in need of second double lung. Community rallies around Sand Springs father hospitalized. There are tons of these stories, and they often inspire us. And they inspire us because they touch part of how we are deeply wired by the Lord. To have relationships with each other, to love one another, to spend money on one another to use our resources as a means to grow in Christ together. Because better than all the experiences in the world, better than all the stuff, better than all the knowledge, better than one million dollars is a few good friends. Would you pray with me? God, we give thanks to you that you sent your son to be our friend. God, that you didn't just plop down money in our laps because you know that we forget what we are built for. We thank you that Jesus offers us a reminder, that he offers us salvation, that he offers us healing in broken relationships. Lord, in the capacity to reach out to others and to build more relationships because that is what you desire of your children. And God, I pray that we would take the initiative to do that. In your name I pray, amen.